This is Andy Purawal for Boxing Social in association with Betfred and I'm the joined by trainer Jamie Moore here in London. Jamie, first and foremost, how are you? Yeah, I'm alright, thank you mate, you? I'm all good, I imagine you're not uh, alright given the events that happened this weekend. Please don't tell me talking about football. <laughs> no, mate, listen, here's what it is. We, we know we've got loads of, loads of work to do. Um, but yeah, it wasn't great. I walked out after the fifth goal. <laughs> you walked out? <laughs> so, is Rocky Fielding a Liverpool fan or...? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he didn't bother texting me. I think I blocked him, actually. <laughs> uh, Jamie, I saw it from the football and that devastating defeat. Um, obviously, here in London, head of Chantel Cameron's unification back with Mary McGee. Firstly, how has camp gone as we taper down towards Saturday night? Yes, do you know, we, we rarely have any problems with Chantel during training camp. Um, she always comes in relatively fit, um, sort of tactically. We've been talking about this fight for a while because we sort of thought it could happen. Um, so it's been pretty, sm- it's run pretty smoothly. No injuries. Um, weight weight making's gone fine. So uh, so as far as training camps go, it's been pretty straightforward. Um, we know it's not an easy fight because why would it be? You know, unification fight for the ring magazine belt, but. When I look at both fighters, I just feel like I've got the fighter who's got more in her arsenal, more strings, um, more strings to her bow. And um, you know, although Mary punches hard, um, I wouldn't say she punches harder than Chantel. And and I feel like Chantel's skill sets um, more varied than, than Mary. So, uh, so yeah, I feel like it'd be a good fight, but I think it's going to be a devastating performance from Chantel. I know you'd have studied Mary in the build-up to this fight, but just going off today, the workout, she was only in the ring for a few minutes, but did you read any, into anything that Mary showed um, during her little workout? No, I don't think you can look at anything what people put on display in an open workout. I think most of the time um, it's just sort of basic stuff. Um, no one wants to give the game plan away. So they either do the opposite of what they're going to do or they do just basic stuff. And, uh, and if she did do the stuff what I'm, I'm anticipating she's going to do on the night then it wouldn't be a surprise to me anyway it wouldn't be mean that I'd change anything or do anything different so she's not really giving me anything away and she was sort of shouting a few little bits of stuff on the way out which to me is means that she feels uncomfortable you know the, the loudest one in the room is usually the, the least confident that's something which I was going to bring up. You mentioned as she was leaving, she was shouting, she was, she was actually saying the champ is leaving now. Um, is that how you see it? Because of her, how loud she was, she's very much so seeing herself as an, in an uncomfortable position ahead of Saturday? I don't think you can sort of talk about it from an individual point of view. Um, that might not be the case, but in general, usually the ones who sort of shout them mouth off are the ones who are trying to intimidate someone and they're doing that for a reason. Chantel is so supremely confident in her own ability she doesn't feel the need to shout her, shout her mouth off or gain an advantage in any, any sort of way because she's already super confident that she's going to do the job on the night so um, listen everyone's different aren't they maybe, maybe Mary feels like she needs to do that to, to sort of get herself in the zone or whatever I don't know but it doesn't affect Chantelle at, at all you know if, if, if it's a civil build up that's fine with her if someone tries to rile her or get a get a, get a back up, it just seems to motivate her even more. It doesn't annoy her. It just it just seems to sort of ignite the fire. So so either ways, you know, I'm happy with it. What does Chantel want to show to the audience come Saturday night, Jamie? You know, it's a unification fight. It's a road towards undisputed. She's spoken openly about her desires to face Katie Taylor at some point. This is the first big opportunity to impress and to show that she deserves these opportunities now, show where that she belongs as one of the best female boxers. So what is she wanting to show on Saturday night? Well, I think just keep the momentum going what she's already got. Um, people are already talking about her as you know, exciting. Um, she's got a, sort of every type of style she can, she can cover. She won the title boxing on the back foot. Uh, she defended it in Las Vegas on the front foot, real aggressive. That's generally her first and foremost um, favourite uh, way to fight. Um, and I think Mary's thinking that Chantel's going to go out there and try and sort of box her on the back foot and, and run from her. And uh, I don't feel like Chantel needs to do that in any way, shape or form. I think Mary's going to get a shock. 
uh, in terms of Chantel's power. I don't think people understand or, or appreciate how hard she is um, and the volume of punches what she gives um, your way. And it's not just that, it's the, it's the way she delivers them and sort of she's pretty clinical with it as well. So I'm pretty sure Mary is saying that sort of stuff just because probably the only way she can win this is by dragging Chantal into a fight and hoping that she lands big on her. But even in that scenario, I still feel like Chantal will come out on top. You know, it could be a dog fight and, and she's actually relishing being involved in a fight like that. We spoke about it and uh, she says, I can't wait until somebody's actually good enough to sort of dig down and, and fight back and, and me have a bit of a dog fight. So uh, if that's on Saturday night, then so be it. The crowd are in for a treat. Just moving away from Chantel, but sticking with the gym, uh, obviously we saw the news the other day of that Josh Taylor, Jack Cattrall will no longer happen this year, looking at early next year instead now. Uh, just firstly, what was your initial reaction and Jack's initial reaction to seeing Josh have to pull out for injury? No, obviously gutted. Um, I feel, feel sorry for Josh, actually. You know, he's, injuries in boxing are horrible. I, I, I suffered horrendously myself as a fighter, so, so I have to sort of empathise with him. Um, gutted for Jack because he waited so long and he finally gets his date and then he's put back 10 weeks but you know let's just be try and be glass half full it's only 10 weeks um, it's, it's not like it's beginning of January so you've got all training through Christmas and New Year which is always difficult because it's always difficult getting sparring partners and stuff like that so even though it's, it's a bit of a delay it's not too long a delay and um, and you know, fingers crossed, everything will be all right on the 26th of February. The only thing is, it's fellow my daughter's birthday, so uh, we'll have to celebrate the next day instead. Um, just with it, Jamie, what will be Jack's kind of training plan now? Will he just be ticking over into the new year, I take it, when things will step back up, or maybe just before the new year? Yeah, he's been ticking over for a long time, ever since his last fight, and he's and like his ultimate professional Jack. He spars once a week, keeps his time and a distance in, and. Um, He's been ticking along even since the fight got uh, postponed. So he's off away on holiday with a, with a missus. He's going to do a two-week break and he's on strict instruction not to train at all because, you know, he'll do his body good to rest. He'll come back recharged and then he's probably got about 12 or maybe 14 weeks when he gets back. So they can pick up just ticking over and then we'll give it a good 10 weeks uh, proper training camp. We can we can work tactically on stuff. We can sort of train his brain. But in terms of physical training, I'll just want him to hold off until about 10 weeks before. Obviously, Josh is a phenomenal fighter and either him or Tyson seem to be the debate as to who, who's the best fighter in the UK currently. But with Jack heading into this fight, do you think he's being overlooked by people? I think, yeah. I, I, I think that's human nature. You know, someone, Jack is never boxed at this level so so why would anybody pick him to win at this level so I understand it um, he, he hasn't got any sort of pedigree or past history on, on, on boxing at this level at all but it uh, doesn't mean he can't we've seen it in the past you know people stepping up and boxing people Ricky Atten I, I've been using as, as an example when he boxed Costa Zoo even though Josh isn't at the stage Costa Zoo was uh, um, at that time of, of the fight it's very similar in terms of like I think Costa Costa Zoo was around about number four pound for pound fighter at the time Ricky Atten was a big underdog no one gave him a chance and then he went in there and upset the, the apple cart it, it's happened so many times over the years um, so we understand it's a massive ask but you know I keep talking to Jack about watch that fight you know watch Lloyd Unigan versus Donald Curry that's the type of upset we're going for and I've got a fighter I know he's capable of pulling it off um, and that's no slight in whatsoever on the unbelievable talent Josh Taylor is. I'm just co very, very confident in my fighters ever there. Moving on from Jack once again, um, Lerone Harrison. His debut is only around the corner now, Jamie. How excited to finally get the, the journey started with him? Yeah, mate, listen, it's, uh, it's going to be an emotional one on Friday, it really is. And, um, yeah, he's come on so much, he's, he's worked so hard, he's worked on himself technically, uh, fitness-wise. Um, he's matured as well, he's really turning into a young man now. He's only 19, but you can see he's just starting to get to that age where he's maturing. And um, it's going to be a great journey, it's going to be a real exciting one. He's a phenomenal talent. Um, he's got a bit to go in terms of getting to where he needs to get to, 
But, you know, I'm just glad and proud that I'm in a position where I'm going to be able to help him out because, because I know Oliver will be proud of us. It's something I wanted to ask you about. And, you know, you've spoken to me in depth previously about your relationship with Oliver and you've said how you, at times you look at Lerone and you just see Oliver's face in him. But how much of a responsibility do you feel you have to Lerone or to Oliver even to make sure that whatever happens in Lerone's career is for his best because we all know how difficult boxing can be to navigate through at certain times? Of course, and that's what I mean. I'm, I'm glad I'm here for him. Um, I know that if, Oliver, if this situation was around and Oliver could say, right, who, who do I want to look after my son? I know he'd probably pick me or Martin Murray and we're both there for him. So, so the scenario, what I know he would want is unfolded. Um, it, it's, it's still difficult. I'm not going to lie, it's, it's still difficult, but I know that we're going to do him proud regardless of what happens. Um, if he's looking down watching his son now, he'll be saying, he'll be saying I'm proud of you because of the way he's applied himself, he's dedicated himself for the last 15 months since he's been training with us, the amount he's improved. Um, you know, we're fortunate in, to have so many talented fighters around in our gym, in and around that weight division. So we do a lot of technical sparring. So he's been fortunate enough to learn off them. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking forward to, to doing him proud and you know, it's, it's, it's such a shame that he's not going to be around to, to witness it, but, but we'll do our best to make him, make him proud. Just for those who will follow the journey starting with this weekend, how would you assess Lerone's style? How would you kind of break it down for those who will tune in and watch? Um, I'd say he's first and foremost a boxer. He's a switch hitter, so he's, so he's, he's predominantly orthodox, but he can box southpaw as well. Um, he's developing that pressure style fighters fighting as well which I, I'm a big believer in trying to have you don't have to be an expert in every area but you should be able to look after yourself in every area so so he's getting that way with it and um, and you know he's a slick slick sharp shooter um, he's awkward he can hit a bit and um, like I say he's young so we have to be careful with him early on make sure we develop him properly but in 12 to 18 months I can see him by the time he gets to 21, people are going to be looking at him and going, this kid can fight. And uh, yeah, it'll be, I'm, just, I'm just proud. I'm, re I'm really proud of the, the way he's applied himself and the anticipation of the journey. Is, uh, it it's, it's gets me emotional, you know what I mean? Well, I look forward to following that journey uh, come Friday night, Jamie. But just moving on once again, obviously we had a brief chat about Rocky Fielding. He's getting ready for his own bout uh, out in Dubai. But we've seen he's been sparring Badu Jack. Obviously, I know you're not out there to see. But what's his kind of his conversations with you and feedback to you being like with regards to that sparring? Yeah, yeah. He said it's been going great. He said it's been really, really good work, which is it's so difficult to get that type of work, especially out in Dubai. So I think you know for for Jack as well, it's probably. Um, appreciative of the of the quality work because it's few and far between over there um, at the moment. Uh, he said it's been great. He's over there. Danny Vaughan's helping him out training over there in the gym. So um, so yeah, it's going really well. And obviously, I can't be there because of the stuff we've been going on. But I'll be over there for the fight. And uh, um, it's just an eight round at the moment. Uh, but you know, moving forward, I think February or March they want him boxing out there again in a sort of fifty fifty fight. So uh, so yeah, it's an exciting times for Rocky. You know, it was opportunity for him to you know maybe he wasn't going to get that many opportunities but new promotion set up over there in the one who did Carl's fight over there and he was interested in working with him and they give him a free fight deal and, uh, and they want to really push him over there I was going to say Rocky's had a bit of a tough time since the Canelo loss really to try and get the right opportunities I know certain fights might have been offered to him but on short notice and what have you but is this very much now kind of make or break for him? He needs a run, otherwise he's, he's going to have to consider stepping away from the sport because of how difficult a few years it's been to try to get the correct fight? Yeah, well, I think it's been difficult for every fighter over the last couple of years, even the ones who've been busy in terms of no crowd and you know motivation and stuff like that. But Rocky, he boxed, I think it was the October before the initial lockdown. He was just about roundabout due to box again. Um, but... Yeah, I think Rocky would agree. This is probably the last stage of his career now, or the last chance for him to sort of get an opportunity to become a world champion again. Um, 
you know, he's more than capable. It's not like I expected a bit of ring rust when he came over to England. You know, he's just been ticking over himself. He's not been in, in the gym or in, in or around us for all the time during the lockdown. And he came over and sparred, and it was like he'd never been away from the gym. So it was, um, it was refreshing to see. It was, it, was, it was nice to see he was still on form. And it made me sort of reaffirm my belief that he's still got a lot to offer. Um, I've said this loads of times, his, his punching power is so underrated. Um, his ability is underrated. And uh, if he gets the right opportunity, he can become a world champion again, definitely. Just two other topics I want to touch on before I let you go, Jamie. Firstly, next weekend, a huge undisputed bout between Sal Canelo Alvarez, somebody you'll know well, and uh, Kerry LePlant. What's your thoughts on it now? We're only a week away. Um, I think it's a great fight. I think, obviously, Canelo is the favourite, and, and I think Canelo will win. But Plant, I think Plant's going to surprise a lot of people. I don't think people can sleep on him. Um, going off the reaction to the little scuffle at the, the press conference, he's not intimidated by him, which is one of the main things you need to, to have a, a, any chance of winning a fight of that magnitude. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to watching it. I want to see how, how Plant comes out. I'm unsure whether he's going to come and, and put it on Canelo or whether he's going to try different tactics and sort of box him. So it'd be interesting to see, but... I can, I can never sort of get past what, what, the different styles of Canelo and how well he can adopt both types of what, fighting in, in terms of pressure fighting or, or the, the sort of real slick defensive moves. I can't get away from a, a Canelo win, even if he sort of gets dragged into a dogfight. But it's interesting. I think going back to when Canelo was a, um, a super weller, I always felt like the only way someone would beat him would to drag him into a dogfight and outwork him because he was so tight at the weight whereas middleweight or super middleweight that's not really sort of part of the equation now so uh, so size is a little bit of an issue but he more than holds his own and we've seen what he did when he even moved, moved up to light heavyweight so uh, so I think it'd be a great fight for the fans but I, don't, I just can't see past Canelo winning and then final thing Jamie I don't know whether you watched it or not but I saw an Anthony Joshua interview released yesterday yeah. I just want to get your thoughts on it if you, if you did or you didn't but if going under kind of the impression that you did. Um, we saw a different kind of approach from him. He was a lot rawer, we'll go with, he was kind of just speaking a lot more openly. What did you take of seeing that side to him in comparison to maybe a bit more of a, a controlled approach we've seen throughout the last few years when he's answered certain questions and what have you? Um, I thought it was good to see. I think, I said this last week in a different interview, hindsight's a great thing. And, you know, it was probably... The, the team's thinking behind the game plan was Usyk's never going to expect us to try and outbox him so maybe we'll catch him by surprise and it just didn't quite work out so now we can look back and go well that wasn't a great idea but maybe it was a it, if, if it had worked out better than they'd have planned then it would have been a great idea so I think I, I wouldn't have adopted those tactics but I can sort of see where maybe they came up with that idea Two things I think he needs to do in terms of being able to enforce, because his mindset seems to be that now, sort of going like, fuck it, let's just go for it. And I think that was the, his best chance of winning that fight was to do that. I think maybe that the, the performance and in hindsight, now he's looking at that going, that's what I should have done. Um, I think he needs to have one voice in the corner. Now, my, my, my big thing on the night watching it was, why is there so many people talking? Because that can only be confusing. Um, we were talking about it earlier on, actually. If, if you've set out a game plan and, and maybe it's 70% right and 30% wrong, even under them circumstances, if you're 100% committed as a fighter and it's only 70% right, but you've got heart, determination, will to win, and it's not 100% going your way, but it goes your way 70%, you're still going to come out on top. Now, the way Chisora went about the fight, you know, that sort of pressure fighting, I always call it simplifying to, to my guys, I always say, you know, don't, if someone's a supreme boxer to so you, don't try and outbox him. You've got to simplify it, you've got to sort of go rawer with it and just... Not, not try and match them sort of for speed or for skill or for movement. Just make them fight, make them work. You've got to take them into a place they don't want to be. And I think that's what he's got to do with Usyk. And one of, one of AJ's 
biggest attributes was his strength and power. And it was sort of non-existent in the fight because he wasn't able to to implement it against Usyk. That's that's credit to Usyk for being able to do it. But I don't think AJ um, enforced himself like he can do in the fight. And if if he if he goes into the rematch going, do you know what? I'm just gonna fucking go for it. I'm fit. I'm strong. He's got to be tight on the way in. But if he knows, if he sort of doesn't give an Usyk anything to play off straight into punching range he's nice and tight and then just roughs him up and, and and goes punches through the target works his body well he's gonna he's gonna come through some rough awkward moments but that's probably his best chance of winning so um the interview to me it was like a realization for him that i, I know what i need to do i'm still unsure of who's going to give me the information or how i'm going to get to the point where i need to get to but i feel like he's on the right path to finding out where he needs to get to to give himself the best chance of winning that's something I wanted to touch on a bit more with you especially as you're now in a training capacity he's had Rob McCracken Angel Fernandez and Joby Clayton in his corner for the last few fights now he's out in America speaking to a few trainers just kind of getting more knowledge he hasn't left Rob or any any of the trainers but he said openly that there's the potential to maybe bring somebody in or to work with his current training group and see how they can all just get onto the same page. Is that not more confusing knowing that he's going out there speaking to other trainers who will have different approaches, different ideas as to how to fight against somebody like Alexander Usyk and then he could come back, speak to Rob McCracken who could say, they've told you this, but then I think it's a different way that we should approach it. Yeah, and, and that's what I meant before. So for, the, for those reasons, that's why I'm saying there's got to be one voice. And even if, so, so for argument's sake, he goes, right, I've been around all these gyms and I've got some information on board, which is a good thing. Education's always a good thing. But that doesn't mean you need those guys in the corner or those guys in training camp for the, for the rest of training camp. Now, if he goes then back to Rob and they, they go, they, they both agree, because AJ's an experienced fighter and he's a knowledgeable guy himself. So I don't necessarily think he needs all these people's information to come in because he's already been educated by those people over the last three, four years or whatever. If Rob then implements a game plan and goes, this is what we're sticking to rigidly. We're not going to go away from it. We're not going to have him telling you one thing and him telling you the other. And then all the, all the way, you know, the lead up in the changing rooms to the fight, Rob's telling him one thing and then he walks off and he's, he's limbering off. And then someone else is saying, listen, don't forget, I told you this. And then it's like, oh, well, Rob didn't say that. Which, whose advice do I follow? It has to be the same advice. So don't veer off it, stick to it. You know, you might have to tweak things along the way. Rob, so Rob might go, okay, listen, have a round off now. You, might, you need a rest round, you need to recover, go for a little walk this round in round six or seven, whatever, and then go back to it. You don't need people going, no, stay on it now, if he's trying to tell you that, because it's just confusing. If you have trust in your coach, trust in yourself, trust the game plan's the right one, and don't forget he's already lost to Usyk. So the, be the next best thing you can do is go in there and give it a better effort this time, and he might still lose, but at least he'll, at least he'll lose trying his best to win with his best attributes. So I think he needs one game plan, one sole voice in the corner. Um, educate yourself, yeah, of course, because you can never learn enough of experienced people. But I just feel for, to give himself the best chance of winning, one game plan, one voice, and just go for it. I know it's hard to say, but if you're in Rob's shoes as well and you know your fight has gone away to start listening or to kind of gain more information from other fighters, let's put it to an example for you. If you had one of your fighters go away and want to come back to you, does that change the relationship at all? I think Rob's accepted help or AJ's want of help with other people and it's needed sometimes Rob's a busy guy and he's out he's, you know, he's all over with GB so, so I understand it um, see so I can only talk off my own experience and my experience with Nige is that we're on the same page all the time and, and even if the odd thing here and there um, is a difference of opinion so, so, so to speak I'll always say something or we'll, uh, we'll, we'll discuss it and I'll say listen this is the best thing to do so you always need somebody who's the head trainer 
and I, Nigel, I couldn't ask for anyone better to be to be by my side. I trust him implicitly, and we're always 99.9% .9 of the time on the same page. So that's why it works. So if I'm going away with GB, if I'm in Rob's shoes and I'm going away with, G, with, G, with GB, I know that I've got Nigel there with the lads who is, is do, going about the business the same way as I would go about the business. So that's why we're, it, it sort of works. So I'm not sure how Rob feels about having other people who he's not brought in. It's not his decision. So whether he then makes the decision and goes, AJ's my mate and I understand he wants to do it and I'm never going to walk away from him. So I'm going to stick by him and I'll, and I'll see this through. I'd admire him for that. I'd also understand if he goes, AJ, I want the best for you, but I can't do this job properly unless you let me do the job. If you're asking me and another two, three people to do it, then that's not me doing the job. So, listen, why don't you go and find someone else? I don't understand that as well. So, at the end of the day, AJ is going to do what he feels like he has to do for himself, and he should do, because he's a fighter, and he's, it's a short career, you've got to do what you feel is best. It might not work out the best, but at this point in time, if he feels he needs to change trainer, then he needs to change trainer because that's how he feels inside. And if he's feeling that, then when he's going forward now in this camp, he's going to be second guessing himself. I should have gone to a different trainer. Doesn't mean he does. I don't think he does. I think Rob McCracken is a man for him if he's got his trust in him. And I think he's the right person for the job. I think Rob McCracken is the right person for the job. But if AJ's starting to feel like he's not, then he's already got one foot out the door and he's probably never going to commit to what Rob's saying to him. So, it's a difficult one because I don't think, you know, I, I was with Oliver for my fifth fight. I trusted him implicitly. We never had any outside interference and I finished my career with him. And, it's, and, it, and, and I like that loyalty and that, that structure. But, you know, so that's, that's why I, th I think if Rob goes, you know what, I'm not going to go away. If you, that's what you feel like you need to do, I'll support you then I'd admire that with him because he's loyal to. Jamie, just quickly stopping us there before the camera times out. Um, just moving on from AJ, one topic which we quickly wanted to touch on, which we forgot to, or I forgot to, rather, is obviously we see Dylan White pulling out of the Otto Violin fight through injury, injury which means that um, Chantel will headline against Mary McGee on Saturday night. I just want to get your thoughts on that because you know, some people suggesting he might have pulled out because he holds that interim title and very much expecting to see the WBC order him to face Tyson Fury soon. What's been your thoughts around that? Um, I think you, you can't doubt someone uh, with an injury. Um, it could it could be, and I understand it, it could look like he's pulled out for that reason, and he might well have done, but he might, do, might, he might well have done because of that, and he's got an injury also. You know, it, it could be um, six or one half, of the, half a dozen of the other. Um, I got asked the other day of somebody else if you was in Dylan White's shoes, would you then now go through with a walling fight knowing that you're probably, probably going to be made mandatory? And my answer to that would be, no, I wouldn't. Because I've, I've, I've been in that situation where I've been waiting for a fight to come around. And when you wait for that long, you know, I've spoke about this in the past as well, Dylan White has waited so long, it's criminal. It's sort of a similar situation to Jack Catterall and it's politics, and, and sometimes it's through no one else's fault. But I'd hate to see Dylan White go into a fight against Wallin, potential banana skin, because he's no mug, and then for, it, for Wallin to upset the apple cart and him not get his opportunity. Because if you're asking me, do I want to see Dylan White v Wallin or Dylan White v Tyson Fury, it's Fury v White all day long. So, so no. To answer the question, I wouldn't take the risk uh, because one, I do think it's a risk. I don't think it's an easy fight, and two, it'd be criminal if he if he doesn't get his opportunity after waiting so long. Right, Jamie, we'll leave it there now. Leave you to enjoy the rest of your evening. I appreciate your time as always, and thanks, Speed's Boxing Social. Cheers, mate. <laughs>